This is London. Today, in the hearing of an innumerable congregation of their subjects and of millions of listeners all over the world, their majesties, King George VI and Queen Elizabeth, are to be crowned at Westminster Abbey. Along the route to and from the Abbey, and in the Abbey itself, observers are posted who, from each point of view, will depict the crowded scenes. This morning, they will describe the procession which escorts the King and Queen to the coronation. When the ceremony is over, they will follow the course of the great return procession through London, back to the palace, from which, in a few minutes, their majesties will set out. We begin this broadcast by taking you, wherever you may be listening, to Buckingham Palace. The Royal Standard is flying over the palace and floating out in a slight breeze. The gold and the red and the blue of the court rings and the, and, the, and the white pearl stand out against this dull grey day. It's one of those sort of days that we know so well in London. And somehow it shows up the splendour of the scene, and which has been gradually building up in brilliance for the last two hours. Now, stretching away in front of the railings of the palace itself, are the three guards of honor. Nearest to us, the blue, the light blue of the Royal Air Force. In the middle, the scarlet of the guards. And further beyond, the dark blue of the Navy. And it's the naval band which this moment is playing. And twinkling amongst that, or behind it rather, are the brass instruments and the gold of the guards' band. The King's procession is forming up it's really formed and ready to move forward later on. And just into the mirror is the band of the Royal Scots Greys. And then behind that, the King's orderly officers. And then the field marshals, scarlet with their plumed hats. The war office staff, the air council, in that lighter blue. And the full dress of the board of admiralty all mounted. Behind them come the more business-like looking uniforms of the King's Colonial Escort in Khaki and the King's Dominion Escort. And then providing a sudden very brilliant flash of color, His Majesty's Marshalman, the Yeoman of the Guard in that Tudor bonnet, and the King's Barge Master and Waterman. In fact, there's really so much brilliance and color just here that one's rather inclined to forget the crowds. Here, of course, the crowds will get their first view of the, of the state coach as it comes out of the palace. And then again, as the state procession returns from the abbey. And from where we look, on all this, the background of the palace seems to stand out so well. It probably must be the only undecorated building in London, except for the royal standard floating above it. And his long grey frontage behind the forecourt, uh, with its uh, high gilt-topped railings, looks magnificently dignified and straightforward in all this uh, confusion of colour around us. And then in the centre, the balcony uh, uh, where the king and queen will come out after their return to the palace. Below that is the archway leading into the quadrangle. And it's here that the coach and the divisions of uh, the sovereign's escort are already waiting. And then around are all the buildings of the state apartments and the private apartments and the sovereign. And for one of these rooms, an observer will describe the scene in the quadrangle uh, in a few minutes. And beyond again, all this building stretches the palace gardens. And all this is set in the green parks of London. I can only see from where I am even the, the, just the tops of the buildings, above the treetops, not yet in full leaf, but in the fresh spring green. 
It's a remarkable thing, many of you don't know it. And for those of you, it's fair to tell you that here, the palace, set all round with green parks, green trees, and yet in the very heart of London. There's an inscription which so aptly describes it above one of the garden doors of the palace. The gods delight in such a situation. Now, let me tell you just one or two things about the broadcast today. It's a long broadcast, and we're going to take the procession to the Abbey, but as it will be some minutes before the King sets out, and it'll take him some time to get there, we shall be hearing from the uh, Abbey, first of all. After the King leaves on his journey, then we shall later hear the, uh, an observer at the Cenotaph, and then as the coach nears the abbey, an observer there will describe his arrival. A marshalling of the great proceeding while it enters the west door and moves up to the altar will be described from inside the abbey and from the annex. And then later on we shall be following the state procession from time to time through the streets of London. And then it reaches Hyde Park where our observer will describe it in detail. The boys, the Boy Scouts, have been darting about the roads here for some time, running across and selling their official programs. And one of the incidents we noticed here was that one of the yellow plushed footmen came out from the palace, walked across the forecourt, and called to a boy and bought his program. Several processions have already left, and the King's procession is the last of all to leave. But he's not due yet for several minutes. The sun is just breaking through, and I can see the two towers of Westminster half a mile or more away, beyond the trees of St. James's Park. And so we'll take you there now to hear what's happening from our, our observer outside the west door of the Abbey. Outside the Abbey. Actually, my position is almost on the roof of the Middlesex Guild Hall, overlooking the annex of which you are going to hear so very much before this day is done. This annex down there has been specially built out from the west door of Westminster Abbey for the occasion. It's a pleasant, light-colored building in concrete rough cast, rather like a little flat-roofed church in itself. It's got a tower above the great main doorway through which the real people in this great ceremony will pass. The doorway is rather remarkable. The canopy overhead is in red and gold. The steps are clothed in a lovely blue with white lines around the edges. As for the doors themselves, the uh, woodwork is of singular beauty and it may interest a lot of listeners to know that they were made out of the timbers of the old Waterloo Bridge. Uh, the walls of the annex, uh, the windows of the annex rather, are barred in, uh, with gilt spears standing upright and the walls are decorated with the coats of arms of the dominions and the crown colonies and so forth. For here, from here, for instance, I can pick out quite easily the fine coat of arms of Canada with the familiar royal arms, the free maple leaves and the fleur de lis representing French Canada. And that's the annex, and I think you should understand at this stage very clearly that it has been built out there specially to be a robing room and a place in which the great proceeding into the abbey proper can be marshaled. Uh, down uh, hereabouts, the road uh, leading from Parliament Square to the annex is particularly narrow, and we don't see very much of the crowd. There is one great big stand bang opposite us, uh, almost hiding the abbey from our sight, and down below there's a crowd of the public eight deep. On the other side of the road, however, it's been kept perfectly clear. There's a long awning under that stand of which I've talked, and that leads into the annex proper. The troops lining the road here are um, gentlemen cadets of the Royal uh, Academy at Woolwich, uh, which is the Gunners School, and just below me, the bottle green of the um, 16th London Regiment, the Queen's Westminsters, who of course get a place of honour. The spectacular military part of the thing is the great guard of honor drawn up in front of the door of the annex. This is provided by the Coldstream Guards. They have on the left, uh, their left flank, which is near me, a double line of Royal Air Force men in that perfectly lovely blue that Air Force men have. 
And uh, there are three bands round about. I saw them marching in. I can't see them just at the moment. Uh, one, the band of the coal steams. We saw the, the Royal Marine Band and the Royal Air Force brought its own band. Well, we've had a perfectly marvellous time sitting here for the last four hours watching it. All the people arrive. All the peers in the robes. This little, some of many of them brought their own little sons as pages. Bonny little boys with blue coats or red coats or brown coats or whatever the taste might have run to. And they were very, very charming to see indeed. Uh, the gentlemen at arms, or the gentlemen ushers rather, with the red and gold sticks were running about sorting cars in. And so we had a great series of processions of very distinguished people whom it was a del delight to recognize. The foreign uh, representatives got a very fine cheer from the crowd hereabout. The first arrival of these was Prince Paul of Yugoslavia, who wore a, a black uniform. And then came, shortly afterwards, Princess Juliana of Holland with Prince Bernhardt, and they get a wonderful reception. Prince Bernhardt, a very gallant-looking figure in uh, the uniform of the Black Hussars, and Prince Juliana looking very charming with a lovely fair head. Princess Chichibu of Japan was wearing cloth of gold. One of our biggest activities here was provided by Boy Scouts, who, as we heard from Buckingham Palace, were selling programs. Here they were opening carriage doors, picking up trains, helping on old gentlemen with their swords, and actually one part of them did their good day's work by helping to push off a car that had broken down. And so it's been very grand ever since we went on. And uh, we've all enjoyed ourselves thoroughly. The, the sight, the color, has been magnificent. Particularly the, the Indian people, with most marvelous colors. Just one short message here. Would those people in charge of the loudspeakers around the annex please uh, switch them down? They're causing some interference. And... Um, Oh, pardon that small interruption, which was purely technical. I wanted to talk about these Indian and Oriental people. Their colors were the most amazing description. Pearl, pink, coral, cloth of gold, and all the rest of it. Now, we're waiting here. There is a pause, and Queen Mary's procession is still to come. But it arrives just as the king sets out from the palace. So we can't wait for that here. But there's just time to take a look inside the annex and see what it's like behind those gothic windows I was talking about. And so, now, we shall take you inside the annex. Well, I'm looking down on all the activity in this great hall here from a position situated above the main archway leading to the royal entrance. Now, this is the main assembly hall of the annex. And over in the far corner, I can see the magnificent Gothic arch of the Abbey West Door, which has been built into the assembly hall. At the moment, there's great activity. There's peers and peeresses, distinguished foreign guests, famous men and women from all grades of public life have been passing to their seats under the great arch and to the Abbey beyond. The hall itself is lofty and divided in the center by four massive pillars. And the walls are a soft gray, and the carpet a magnificent deep blue. And beneath me here is a glittering mass of gold and ermine and crimson and blue, a patchwork of color and reflected color. And over and beyond the crowd with their, with their robes and mantles, uh, standing also like against the wall, is a long table covered with a cloth of heavy gold. And the frontal is embroidered with the royal arms. Well... Dignitaries are ready, um, are ready at the entrance now to receive Queen Mary and escort her to the palace in the Abbey, um, uh, her place in the Abbey. And there's also our observer inside Buckingham Palace itself, waiting now to see the, uh, the king start off from the quadrangle on his drive to Westminster. And so we'll go straight back to Buckingham Palace. And this time, we'll take you inside the palace itself. Here in the quadrangle... The, their majesties have already arrived. They have just got into the state coach, which is drawn up under the great pillared portico at the side of the quadrangle. 
the king in his uh, crimson robe and uh, the queen in her beautiful robe of uh, purple velvet. We've just had a magnificent opportunity of seeing those robes close to us as uh, their majesties passed down the king and queen's corridor of the palace just within a foot or two of us. And uh, it gave us a wonderful opportunity of seeing the beauty of the work in those uh, wonderful robes. Uh, the courtyard, the quadrangle now is, uh, in addition to the uh, royal coach, there are the four coaches to take the members of the staff, the escort of the lifeguards, and just under this window are drawn up the horses on which I can't actually see them at the moment because they've drawn back out of sight underneath. I saw the Duke of Kent mounting and the Duke of Gloucester and Lord Harwood. It was a most extraordinary thing in the earlier hours of this morning to come in from uh, the bustle and clamor of the crowded streets into uh, this uh, absolutely still and quiet quadrangle, so still and quiet that one could hear the qu birds twittering overhead. It seemed impossible that anything so still uh, should exist uh, in the midst of all this frenzied bustle and excitement that begins only a few yards away and extends over five miles or more of the processional route. Now, looking down from this first floor window, the window, incidentally, of the room from which His Majesty will broadcast this evening. Uh, one feels like a privileged spectator in the wings, watching uh, the assembling uh, pageant on a stage on which the curtain has not yet risen, and the distant cheering that one can hear as other processions are passing along uh, serve to remind one of the unseen audience outside. It's a wonderfully a colorful scene, the whole of this quadrangle at the moment. There's that perfectly amazing coach. Uh, many of you probably saw it in rehearsals, but what it was then is nothing to what it looks today. Those eight Windsor greys with their magnificent uh, gold and uh, crimson trappings. The postillions already mounted, the walking men with their crooked sticks standing behind, beside the horses, and the footmen standing beside the carriage, all in their magnificent royal livery of scarlet and gold. And the wonderful coach itself, it's all, practically all gilt carving. And as it went round this quadrangle while they were exercising the horses, waiting for their majesties to arrive, it looked as though the whole thing were real gold. Uh, it's um, supported, the roof of the coach is supported by eight uh, decorative palm trees carved and gilt. The roof itself is gilt, dome-shaped roof, and on the top, the figures of three boys hold up the, uh, the imperial crown in gold. The whole thing, the, the wheels and all, which are based on the old Roman chariot wheels, the whole thing is gilt with the exception of the painted panels, the work of an Italian artist who also decorated many of the rooms of this uh, palace. And it's a rather wonderful thing to think that uh, we here are seeing this coach today just as London saw it nearly 200 years ago. It's been renovated, of course, from time to time, but apart from that, the only change has been the removal of the box seat, which was taken away in the time of King Edward VII because he felt that it impeded the public's uh, view. Uh, now, as I've been speaking, the uh, escort of the lifeguards has begun to move off, and it's a magnificent sight. The uh, scarlet tunics, the beautiful uh, white plumes, and uh, the sun, which did break through for a moment and is almost breaking through now, glittering on their accoutrements and uh, their swords. They're a perfectly lovely sight. A magnificent body of men. The royal coach is moving. The great moment has come when their majesties set out from their home. A moment that will be greeted outside in the courtyard with uh, the playing of the national anthem and a fanfare of trumpets. And now, let us listen for one moment and hear the coach go by beneath this window. One division of the lifeguards has now gone out. The second is wheeling round behind the coach. And now, as the stagecoach enters the archway leading to the forecourt, we'll go out ahead and wait for it outside Buckingham Palace.
of escort. Coming down to the present, whilst the mass band of the household cavalry move away, and for the first moment the royal state coach comes into view of these crowds who've been waiting for hours and hours, and for that matter for weeks and months to see it. It comes across the forecourt, takes a wide sweep round behind those railings, wildly chaired by all the household staff of the palace, who've been allowed in to stand in the forecourt with their friends, even behind us here in the box, those on the trees, cheering. And I'd wheels to come out of the forecourt and pass these vast and crowded pavements with the colors of the guard of honor drooped. in the world, I think. Must be. All this brilliance of colour here are completely outdone and outshone by the brilliance of the state coach, its walking men, its gilt and colour, its postillions, and above all, their majesties, the king and queen, within the coach. Packages are waved, hats are off, hats are waved, everything, everybody who's been waiting for this shouting and yelling and cheering their heads off. It circles now around the Victoria, the Victoria Memorial. Victoria Memorial is so suitably placed as in here the Queen Victoria left for her coronation the first sovereign to leave Buckingham Palace. Now the sovereign's escort, the last two divisions of the sovereign's escort follow behind these coaches with the king's suite. And the royal state coach has reached the mall. And it's along here that he passes St. James's Palace, the court of St. James, where in December last, on a gloomy, foggy afternoon, so different to today, that the proclamation of George the Sixth was read. And here also he passes by Marlborough House, the official residence of Queen Mary, his mother. Past Carlton House Terrace, Past Captain Cook's statue, so boarded up that it can hardly be seen, and on through Admiralty Arch to Trafalgar Square and Whitehall. And from the top of the monument, Nelson will look down upon all the pageantry which is passing below. The procession goes on between the government buildings, all decked out in brilliant colours, and so to the cenotaph, where we have an observer. But it'll be a good ten minutes before the state coach gets there. And that gives us time to go into the Abbey itself for a description of the scene now set for the King's arrival. And so, into Westminster Abbey. Here in the Abbey, we are looking down from the Triforium along the whole length of the great building, towards the west door. And at this moment, one of the great processions is moving up the Abbey. It is the procession in which Queen Mary comes to the royal gallery down below us here. It's moving up the nave now, golden and very lovely, this procession. And Queen Mary, never was the royal word queen more worthily applied. Queen Mary is in the center of it, wearing 
a golden gown beneath her purple robes, and moving with stately dignity under the golden archway of the organ screen. And before her goes the Queen of Norway, and all dotted round the procession are the heralds in their gorgeous tabards, and now I can see Queen Mary's train bearers, the Earl of Dalkeith, the Marquis of Lansdowne, the Honourable Gerald Lassels, Viscount Errington, and behind them, just coming into view now, the Duchess of Devonshire, Mistress of the Robes, with her page behind her carrying her glittering coronet. And now Queen Mary herself, moving forward, slowly, dignified, bowing, everyone standing in the choir stalls, all the distinguished foreign representatives. And now Queen Mary, below me, moving towards the entrance to the Royal Gallery as the heralds line up and the train bearers gather up a long purple train and she turns and moves in and the Duchess of Gloucester, who is in the front row of the box, stands preparing to receive her and everyone turns and watches this moment of lovely pageantry the precursor of so much pageantry in this great abbey this morning. And so I can see Her Majesty coming into the front row of the box. Down below me, the Royal Gallery overlooking the presbytery, and Her Majesty Queen Mary is sitting down in front of the magnificent golden plate which stands on top of the tomb of Anne of Cleves. Now, I must try to tell you, while for the moment nothing is happening, we're waiting for the beginning of the great proceeding itself, I must try and tell you what we see here, looking down from our position in the Triforium, so many feet above the high altar. Imagine the abbey lying below us in the form of a gigantic cross, we look down the whole length of it from high altar to west door. I can see now the heralds marching away into the distance after leading that procession up. And across it run the transepts. And where the transepts intercept is what is known as the theater, right in the center of the cross. The theater is a raised platform on which stand the thrones of the king and queen, covered in crimson satin, with the royal arms worked most beautifully in them. And here is the center of the picture. And facing it in the south transept sit the peers in their crimson velvet robes. And in the north transept, the peeresses in their mantles of crimson edged with miniver and their velvet kettles and their white gowns and their gold and brocade. It's superb, this massing of color. Then, stretching away towards the west door, lie the choir and nave, carpeted in Worcester blue, uh, divided by the organ screen. And now, below me, the focusing point of the whole ceremonial is the relatively small space in front of the high altar. It's a square of golden carpet upon which stand the two scarlet chairs of estate. I'm looking at them now with the light shining on them, and the coronation chair nearby in the center of this space, the coronation chair famous the world over. Overlooking this, as I said, is the Royal Gallery, and there you have the plan, this great cross, the theater in the center, and the presbytery, that space with the fall stools where their majesties will kneel. Incidentally, on the fall stools, I can see the two books of the order of service which their majesties will use. Uh, incidentally, all the peers and peeresses have these books too. They're covered in um, sort of transparent crinkly paper, which may sound to you like the wind in the trees when they're opened later on. And this uh, chair is the thing the coronation chair, which catches our attention particularly. So clearly can I see it that I feel I can almost touch it. It's a plain wooden chair with high pointed back standing on four golden lines. Most impressively simple among all this magnificence. It's the seat in which all the sovereigns of England, save one, have been crowned since Edward I. And inserted below it, I can 
see clearly the famous stone of school, the stone of destiny, placed there by Edward the First, who had the chair built to hold it. This stone of school, it's a, a rough, craggy slab of hard sandstone, too heavy for a man to lift, with a look of Scottish moorlands about it. This stone has been called the most ancient, respected monument in the world. Now, if you will fix your attention on that chair, that plain wooden chair, this presbytery, the chair facing the high altar some 20 yards away from it, the high altar itself covered with a pall of cloth of gold. And in this space, the coronation ceremonial will take its course. You will hear the approach of this procession, the psalm which begins it. I was glad when they said unto me, we will go into the house of the Lord, which has been sung at every coronation since Charles I. And the boys of Westminster School, you'll hear, shouting first, Vivet, Vivet Regina, as the Queen enters the nave. And then the fanfares and the King's procession, again the Vivets from the Westminster boys, and so to the ceremony itself, which moves in four major phases. The recognition, the oath, the anointing, and the crowning, followed by the crowning of the King. We hear a great deal of this, the Archbishop of Canterbury presenting the king to the people from the four quarters of the compass, the shouts of assent, the grand fanfares of the state trumpeters. We hear the king taking the oath, the cries of God save the king as his majesty is crowned. We may not hear the words of the homage. The anthem perhaps will be too strong for them. But uh, let me explain that throughout the service, rubrics will be read, sentences that is, explaining what's happening so that you'll be able to follow everything. And just one other point, that during the communion service, which follows the crowning of the Queen, we must necessarily leave the Abbey service. But your attention will still be focused by prayers and the communion hymn sung in St. Margaret's Westminster. Well, one final glimpse of this magnificent scene uh, before we leave you. The uniforms and robes and decorations of this massed congregation in the choir stalls, the foreign crown princes, close to the theater. Now I can see Prince and Princess Tutibu of Japan. In front of them, the Indian princes in their turbans and jewels and silks. And as contrast to all this temporal splendor, the old stone of the Abbey, draped with hangings of pale blue and gold, the great carpet of Worcester blue sweeping up along the choir and nave, and under the organ screen I can just catch a glimpse of the king's company colour, and towering away the great arches of the Abbey itself, shaded and dim and infinitely impressive. And now the scene's set until the king's appearance after the ceremony from St. Edward's Chapel, in imperial purple and crowned for the first time with the imperial crown. That's not the crown used for the actual ceremony. That's already been carried down with the rest of the regalia to the annex to await their majesty's arrival in the great hall of assembly. And we'll follow it there by taking you once more into the annex. Well, the regalia still rests where it was laid earlier this morning by the Lord Great Chamberlain on the regalia table. And there it is, on the far side of this great hall, a table not much bigger than a dining room sideboard, covered in cloth of gold and bearing the value of heaven knows how many king's ransoms. The glitter and brilliance that it all throws off is almost indescribable. And towering above the rest is St. Edward's crown, lying on the center of a table on a crimson velvet cushion. As I'm talking to you now, the peers who will carry the different pieces in the great proceeding to the high altar are gathering round the table. The Lord Great Chamberlain, Lord Ancaster, is there waiting to hand out the regalia. And I can see Lord Salisbury there too, the Lord High Steward, in his crimson robe with his ermine cape. He'll be carrying a St. Edward's crown just in front of the king in the great proceeding. It's a gold crown, it's heavy, it weighs over seven pounds, and the circlet and the two arches that rise from it are magnificently jeweled, and on top is a small orb surmounted by a diamond-studded cross. Well, just in front of it on the table lie the swords, the sword of state, the swords of justice, and katana the blunted sword of mercy. You will hear more about them during the service itself. And between the peers as they move about, 
and I sometimes get a glimpse of an enormous diamond that glitters in the headpiece of the king's scepter. You wouldn't believe a stone could have so much life in it. It's as big as a hen's egg, and it's the star of Africa, the Cullinan diamond, or a part of it. The other big diamond on the table comes from India. It's the Kainor, and it's set in the front of the Queen's crown. The Queen's regalia, which consists of only three pieces, a crown, a scepter, and an ivory rod with a white enamel dove at the head, is set on one side of the table. In any other surroundings, that little group would outshine everything else, but now it hardly seems to bear comparison with the gleaming mass of the king's regalia. And each piece of that regalia has a symbolism of its own. The two golden spurs, for instance, that I can just see the Lord Great Chamberlain handing out to Lord Hastings and Lord Churston, uh, they're the emblems of knighthood and chivalry. And the orb, a gold ball, perhaps three times the size of a man's fist, with a jewel cross surmounting it, that signifies that the world is subject to the empire of Christ. And none of this regalia is tremendously old. It's most of it about 300 years old. All the ancient regalia, except the ampulla and the spoon, were destroyed by Cromwell. But it doesn't seem to matter. It's absolutely... Magnificent as it is. And now, one by one, the pieces are being handed out to the peers, and gradually this great proceeding is forming into order. And for the moment, we must leave the regalia in the safekeeping of the great officers of state. I've just heard that the state coach on its way down Whitehall is nearing the cenotaph. And so, over to Whitehall. has just passed the war office of the Admiralty. Everybody's tense, excited, waiting for the great moment. Mm -hmm. Now the skate coach is opposite the Scottish office, particularly gaily adorned with its blue and white flowers, and the <laughs> St. Andrew's crosses, band of the Royal Navy and the Royal Navy School of Music talking opposite, playing opposite the Scottish Army. The crowd here is intensely thick and it's most appropriate that it's lined the route by the Royal Navy, a special tribute to His Majesty who served in the war in HMS Collingwood, the Battle of Jutland, and I think he'll appreciate it more than anything coming down Whitehall. Coach is passing with treasury. There, it's appropriately, the balconies have got gold, rather like the colour of the new threepenny bit. In very few moments, it'll be at Downing Street. Street. 
everybody's heart must be feeling the same thing. Certainly mine is. God bless you both, and long may you reign. Queen looking lovely in her cloak. The king waving to the crowd. They approach the cenotaph. The cenotaph standing there solemnly as it always does, just with its simple inscription: "The glorious dead." Coach is now packing up the cenotaph. Getting our one glimpse of ten seconds, waiting for hours to see our ma Majesty, their Majesty. Coach is now passing the cenotaph. What a contrast it makes! That gold coach and just the go the grey stone as the coach goes by. Past the Home Office, past the Ministry of Health. All these government offices on holiday today, looking so different from their usual solemnity. So it goes on to Parliament Square with its packed stand, the stands there in Paris Yard, no cloud on the pavement on the west side, stand in the middle, particularly stands out, conspicuous with its red and yellow covering, looking for all the world like some vast merry-go-round. Get a brief glimpse of Big Ben. We've listened to it peeling forth the hours as it came to 11 o'clock, that fatal hour of 11. On past Westminster Hall, turning right, past St. Margaret, bells peeling forth as they've done for over 300 years as a monarch approaches the Abbey for his coronation. And on to the Middlesex Guild Hall, next door to Westminster Hospital. From there you'll get your last view of their majesty before they enter the Abbey. So now, over to Westminster. And here we are waiting for the peak moment of today's great ceremony. We've seen the most marvelous arrival of this procession one by one, as you've heard it described, sir. Just passing me now are the gentlemen of the king's bodyguard, the yeoman of the bodyguard, followed by the king's barge master and the waterman. And now the most miraculous outfit of Indian cavalry of all sorts. Blue, yellow, red uniforms, light blue, horizon blue with gilt tops. There's one very restless horse down there, but he's well in charge of a Sikh officer with a great curly bearded face, black face. And here's a great band, not playing. And now over towards the annex, they're evidently getting ready for their arrival. They're appearing on the steps of the annex, these lovely blue steps, a lot of young men. These are the pages of honor who will be ready to carry the, the trains of their, their majesties when they arrive. I can just see the, the robes of the Duke of Norfolk, the Earl Marshal, fully responsible for this enormous ceremony. It must be an extraordinary, worrying, and yet glorious day in his life. Crowd down below is, is very quiet just now. We're not getting so much cheering at this moment. Can you hear the bells of St. Margaret's ringing out now? They must be coming. And that great procession of gray, gray horses, red coats, black horses, bull coats is passing away, way down through Broad St. Tree. Here come the household cavalry, just underneath me. Glittering head helmets, little hill headdresses shining. White fur saddle cloths, black horses as steady as a rock. These horses, of course, are used to this stuff and can do it marvelously. The guard of the guards of honor will present the line of the Royal Air Force just as cleanly as if it were drawn by a razor blade. A lovely line of blue, and then the great line of the coal steamers beyond, with the uh, officer in front carrying the state color, which is only produced on occasions of this kind. More household cavalry coming. The cheering is increasing in intensity. The royal grooms have stepped forward. There's a great row of mounting blocks down there being got ready and the green, blue, and gray boxes which will be carried forward when the state coach arrives so that the great people... And here are the Indians. Indian orderly officers, marvelous. The Edicons, blue turban, blue puggery, I should say, white coat, gold, 
An officer in the Sir Philip Game, the commissioner for police, in a blue uniform with plenty of silver about it. And now comes the state coach. Oh, lovely sight. The walking men beside these lovely Windsor greys, beautifully almost white, covered with a sort of filigree of brown and gold. The state coach and the Majesty's perfectly clear inside it. Now I'll let the cheering speak for itself for a moment. is drawing up at the door now. The dignitaries are running forward with the stool. There's a general halt. I noticed as she passed that the queen was very pale, but looked very, very pretty, bowing very shyly. Now the footstool has been put down. I noticed that the Duke of Kent was rather pale. And out come the great figures. The state coach is marvellous just now. Just getting a shaft of sunlight from the top of it. People are saluting as the king and queen step out. And now, we're moving inside the annex very, very quietly. The Duke of Glasgow and the Duke of Kent are rather far behind in this procession, but they will be moving up after the escort immediately behind the state coach clears away. There's a man who walks behind the hind wheels of the state coach and twiddles a brake when it comes to rest. It's a magnificent great thing. It's moving slowly there, naturally, because the robes are very heavy. The king in his red robe. There's an officer galloping up. I think his horse is doing the most extraordinary things past this fantastic scene, like a pack of cards to come to life. It's still a slow proceeding. The crowd is very quiet now. It's its great peak moment. There's a long halt. And now the guard has come to the slow arms. The king and queen have gone inside, and they're being followed by the Duke of Gloucester and the Duke of Kent, who are dismounting now. And now I leave the next part of our story to our observers inside the annex. Well, their majesties, the king and queen, are now passing into their roving rooms while the great proceeding takes its shape. Already many distinguished foreign representatives have been ushered to their places by heralds. And a moment, a few minutes ago, um, a procession of the princes and princesses of the blood royal with heralds and coronet bearers also went up into the abbey. And I saw Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret Rose on either side of the Princess Royal, looking perfectly lovely in their long dresses of white lace over, the, over white silk and their purple velvet robes. And behind them came the Duchess of Gloucester and the Duchess of Kent, also in the royal purple with ermine capes. And um, lastly came the Queen's procession. Uh, the Queen with a model of dignity and loveliness in her gold brocade dress and, and robes of imperial purple. And with her, the Queen of Norway, her sister-in-law. And now in front of me, this great concourse. Well, the service begins with a fanfare of trumpets. And following that, there will be a part of an anthem, and then look out for the vivats as the queen enters. Now, the proceeding is taking its shape. Uh, first, uh, It's divided into four parts. First come the ecclesiastics, and then uh, the orders of knighthood and chivalry, and then the queen's procession, and then the king's procession. In front are the domestic chaplains in scarlet and the uh, cross of Westminster, and then come in magnificent green and gold copes the prebendaries of Westminster. 
And also then the Dean of Westminster. Well, you may be wondering why the clergy of Westminster plays such an important part in the in the great proceeding. But it's been their right since time immemorial um, when uh, to instruct the king and queen in the rites and ceremonies of the coronation. And in addition to that, the dean helps the Archbishop of Canterbury during the ceremony, as you'll hear later. Well, there seems to be a stirring in the crowd at the moment, and I can see all the officers of the orders of knighthood getting into line. We we'll come next in the procession, and they represent what's really the most picturesque sight in the hall. There's Lord Willingdon there, magnificent and dignified in his deep purple satin mantle, as Chancellor of the Order of St. Michael and St. George. The gold chain of the order around his neck, and long white ribbons on his shoulders, and he looks a magnificent sight. Lord Willingdon is followed by various other officers of the Orders of Knighthood. The Chancellor of the Order of the Thistle, the Earl of Mar and Kelly, with a rich green mantle lined with white silk. And then come the standards of the Empire, uh, headed by the standard of the Empire of India, and then the High Commissioners of the Dominions bearing their respective standards. I see Mr. Tabata there, the High Commissioner for South Africa, and Mr. Jordan, the High Commissioner for New Zealand, and uh, following him, uh, Mr. Bruce of Australia, who's got a lot of friends here in London, and then Mr. Massey, High Commissioner for Canada. Then come the standards of the quartering of the Royal Arms. Uh, I see Lord Derby's massive figure there. And then the Union standard, borne by Mr. Frank Dimmock, the King's Champion and Lord of the Manor of Scribblesby. He's rather an interesting personality because uh, when they used to hold uh, the coronation banquet after the abbey service, it was the ancient right of his ancestors to ride in West, into Westminster Hall in shining armor and on a white charger. He threw down the glove in challenge to anyone who denied their rightful king. The challenge was never accepted, and now that the banquet is no longer held, it's Mr. Dimmock's duty to carry the standard of union, which is simply a silk union jack. And he's followed by the keeper of the jewel house, who um, is carrying a red cushion with the two rings and the sword of offering. And then perhaps comes the most magnificent sight in the whole of this remarkable proceeding. It's in strange contrast to the brilliant uniforms of the heralds which preceded them, and there are four knights of the garter appointed to hold the golden can canopy for the king's anointing. Well, you all know the story of the foundation of the order, um, how the Countess of Salisbury dropped her garter, which was rescued by Edward III, and actually worn by him, and how he instituted the order of which his son, the Black Prince, was one of the first members. Well, the four knights of the, uh, of the, of the garter are Lord Stanhope, Lord Lytton, the Duke of Abercorn, and Lord Londonbury. And they're in the dark, almost fathomless blue mantle of the order. The sort of blue that gives one the feeling one gets treading on a luxurious carpet. And on the breast of their mantles, the shining star of the garter, with this George's cross. And round their necks, the collar of the garter, with the George in white and green and scarlet. Oh, the George, I mean a miniature St. George on a white horse, driving his lance through a, a dragon's mouth. On the shoulders of these magnificent mantles are uh, shining white ribbons, which make a most effective contrast to the to the inky blue of the robes. And there's Lord Lytton there, standing there, grey-haired, fine aristocratic features, famous son of a famous father, and the Duke of Abercorn, the governor of Northern Ireland, and Lord Londonry, who's been for many years well known in, in public life. Now, now here are some civil uniforms after that. Mr. Ramsay MacDonald, the Lord President of the Council, with his white hair made venerable with a thousand political battles. Oh, and following him, with bowed head, Mr. Stanley Baldwin, one of the last of his public appearances as Prime Minister, I suppose. And now, 
I don't think that anyone will deny that this seems a fitting occasion for the close of a public career which has always been marked by integrity and restraint and devotion to his country. And behind him come the Prime Ministers of the Empire, Mr. Lyons, Mr. Mackenzie King, Mr. Uh, General Herzog, for 13 years now the Prime Minister of South Africa, which I think is almost a record, and finally Mr. M.J. Savage, Prime Minister of New Zealand. Oh, and here come the Archbishops. They've taken up their places in line. line. A figure in purple, bearing the cross of York, moves in front. And close behind him, Dr. Temple, the Archbishop of York, in a gorgeous cap of golden brocade, edged with embossings of scarlet. The name of Temple, incidentally, has meant a great deal to the English Church in the last 25 years. Dr. Temple's father was Archbishop of Canterbury and played a no less distinguished part in the Church's development. Uh, and Dr. Temple now plays himself. And there's the Lord Chancellor, Lord Hailsham. And close behind him, at this moment, exchanging a few whispered words with him, the Lord High Chancellor of England in his white wig and his great gown, black and gold. He's the head of the legal profession. He also acts as speaker to the, uh, in the House of Lords, sits on the wool sack. A reminder of the days when the wool trade played a, an all-important part in British history. And now the Cross of Canterbury. And the Archbishop of Canterbury himself in a cream coat. Heavy with gold embroidery. An impressive figure with his white hair and pale face. Deep set eyes. And uh, behind him come the Queen's regalia. These uh, two uh, royal processions, the Queen's procession, a uh, shorter procession right at the east end of the assembly hall. And then in glittering cavalcade, the fourth section, which is perhaps the most important in this magnificent proceeding, the king's procession. The trumpets will have sounded and the anthem will be swelling in the abbey before we get a glimpse of his majesty here. And when he joins the procession, it'll be already moving in solemn state towards the high altar. But I see now between the pillars Lord Haddington uh, just on this side of the line, he's holding the Queen's ivory rod with the white dove in its head. And behind him is the Duke of Rutland, carrying the scepter with the cross. And then again behind him is the Duke of Portland with his crimson robe and his white Minerva cape hanging round his shoulders. And he's bearing in front of him on a crimson velvet cushion the queen's crown. It looks almost like a little castle of diamonds. And behind him comes his page carrying the golden coronet with eight strawberry leaves round the circuit. Then there's a space left in the procession for Her Majesty the Queen, her train bearers, and Mistress of the Robes. And uh, that space at the moment is lined on either side with five gentlemen at arms, magnificent in their uh, crimson and their scarlet tunics, with their plumed helmets. And finally, in a procession all its own comes the king's regalia. Lord Halifax, I can see, just on this side of the procession, carrying St. Edward's staff, and on his right, the Duke of Somerset. He's holding the scepter with the cross. And as he moves it about, I can see that big diamond, the Star of Africa, uh, flashing uh, in a piercing ray across the hall. And then the golden spurs and the three swords. I see the tall figure of Lord Trenchard there, towering above the rest. You remember, he was one of the first uh, air marshals and not for long ago commissioner of police. And by goodness, he looks as though he had the authority for it. And he's carrying the third sword, which Kitchener carried at the last coronation. And then, to break the line of crimson, come the kings of arms. 
There are four of them. Narai, Ulster, Lan, and Clarence Hugh. And they're wearing their quartered tabards of crimson, blue, and gold with black Tudor caps. And behind them are their pages carrying their crowns. And then the Lord Mayor of London, and between him, he's, he's carrying the heavy city mace. And between him and the gentleman usher, the black rod, comes the Gothic King of Arms, also in that magnificent tabard of gold and <coughs> red and blue. And then come the three bishops carrying the pattern, the Bible, and the chalice. And the rest of the procession, except for a little section of it, the king's re uh, the remainder of the king's regalia procession, uh, waits on one side to await the arrival of the king and to form up behind him as he comes in. Uh, his gentlemen at arms, they are plenty of them. They are in their scarlet tunics, bearing their halberds and with these plumed helmets. They are lined up as his escort just inside the doorway below us. Then members of the household, the queries, and yeomen of the guard, uh, waiting to follow His Majesty into the Abbey. A magnificent sight those bishops look in their golden and green copes. There's, um, I noticed there's the Bishop of Norwich in the middle, and the Bishop of Winchester on one side, and the Bishop of London on the other. And um, there are the two bishops who attend on the king, and two bishops who attend on the queen. Well, they're standing down here waiting to receive them. The Bishop of Bath and Wells and the Bishop of Blackburn attend the queen. They must be the two tallest bishops in the British Episcopate, and the bishops of, of uh, Durham and... The, bishop, um, the bishops of Durham and Bath and Wells attend on the king. Um, this must be one of their, their um, one of the last appearances, the public functions as a bishop for Dr. Wynne Wilson, as uh, the bishop of Bath and Wells, as he has declared his intention of um, retiring, and his successor has already been named. Well, now the procession is gradually beginning to move up, and everything is quiet now, and they're all turned towards the royal entrance here. The banners are moving up slowly towards the west door. Everybody's in line and everybody's fairly quiet. The rustling you can hear is just the movement of the standards which are at this moment passing our microphone on the side of the west door of the abbey. They're an absolutely magnificent sight. A splash of colour against this deep blue of the carpet. And round the walls, the King's Company, the Grenadier Guards, form a guard of honour, and they're standing there at the moment at ease. And just below us here, the Earl Marshal, bowing as he walks backwards, and here she is, Her Majesty the Queen with this magnificent purple and gold train embroidered round the edges with the foreign emblems of the dominions and all the countries in the United Kingdom. Behind her, her mistress of the robes, the Duchess of Northumberland, and her page bearing her coronet. And now below us here, the gentlemen at arms have divided, the ranks have divided, and they have formed a broad avenue down which His Majesty will pass. The officer in command of them gives them the order 
to take a pace backwards. And we see now a blue stream running between two crimson banks. It's the most tremendous sight you could ever want to see. And behind the left-hand rank of the gentlemen at arms are the yeomen of the guard with their old Tudor bonnets and carrying their halberds. And now I see just passing into the abbey the second section of the procession. The last of the standards is just passing through the door and I think this is really merely to form up to leave Rome for the remainder of the procession to move in comfortably. As the procession is moving up to the door, um, the clergy of the Diocese of Westminster have moved further in and must be about a quarter way up the nave. And um, incidentally, they make a very fine sight because their copes, uh, some of them are particularly, um, particularly good to look upon because um, ele 11 of them date from the reign of Charles II. And they uh, were 11, they're 11 of an original 12, gold and very heavily embroidered. And then there's another set of copes which are being used today, and they were made for the coronation of Edward VII. They're crimson and heavily embossed with gold, and although they're not really as beautiful as the Charles II ones, they are very impressive and the, the clergy make a very fine sight. Roughly speaking, as we look down on it, we see a mass of, of crimson and blue and ermine. Well, the dark blue represents roughly the civil guests, and the crimson, the peerage, and the peeresses. We are all of us waiting here now for the proceeding to move in. The Earl Marshal has been moving backwards and forwards to, out through the royal entrance to the robing rooms to discover, I imagine, whether their majesties are ready to proceed in. And meanwhile, the procession still moves a little further up into the abbey, and now, just between the pillars, I can see Stanley Baldwin preceded by uh, the Rams and MacDonald, Lord President of the Council, in their blue uniforms with gold epaulets and dark blue trousers with a gold stripe down them. And both of them have these red, big cuffs. And now the Cross of York moves up, and behind it the Archbishop. The Lord Chancellor, I can see in his black robe with its gilt embroidery. And the Queen has now moved between her two bishops, uh, between the five gentlemen at arms who will escort her up the aisle of the Abbey. The ladies and the women of the bedchamber are at the head of the last section of the procession, and they will follow the Queen. They're dressed in ivory-colored silk dresses, and they have short uh, trains of the same color hanging down behind them. The tapestries in the room, the queen is just passing one of the main pieces of tapestry. It's, um, it's a very big piece and stretches, I should say, 20 or 30 feet. And um, it's, uh, it's uh, been lent by Lord Duveen, and some of the other tapestries have been lent by the Duke of Buccleuch. Actually, they are first-class work, and they are copies of cartoons of Raphael. And four of these in the big hall here um, represent uh, incidents from the Acts of the Apostles. I see just opposite me, um, 
uh, Christ's charge to St. Peter, the eleven disciples and uh, Christ uh, talking to St. Peter, uh, who is in front of them, and there's the miraculous draft of fishes just over there, and just round to one side of us, uh, what I, who I suppose to be um, Ananias and Sapphira. And now um, they've moved past the tapestries, and it looks as if the Queen is almost going to get to the door um, any moment. She's moving up towards the door, and the whole procession is moving onwards. Meanwhile, the voluntary swells in the abbey, and the coronation service will begin.